Hello, fellow ag nerd. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and every week I get to sit down with the founders, farmers, innovators, and investors shaping the future of the ag industry. Now, today's episode is a little bit different. You may have noticed that this year I'm, I'm kind of playing with some different variations of my format, sometimes two guests, sometimes three guests, other times I've had a co-host. I even did one where I released two short episodes in the same day. Anyway, I'm always trying to experiment to try to keep things as interesting as possible for you and also for me. Uh, but today's episode is going to be a highlight reel of sorts from a virtual event I hosted for the FOA community. That event was an ag robotics roundtable which featured six robotics companies to have a discussion about the challenges and opportunities of bringing automation to agriculture. The event lasted a total of 90 minutes. I think we used every second of that time, and it was even more enlightening, really, than I had anticipated in setting it up. So today, I'm going to bring you some of the edited highlights from that event in this condensed format. And in this episode, you're going to get a chance to hear more about what's driving the robotics revolution. I mean, it's labor costs, it's non-chemical options to weed control, it's precision agriculture, it's technological advancements getting cheaper and generally more accessible, although there's some exceptions that you're going to hear about today. But what's kind of driving it? We're also going to talk about how these companies are setting up their business models to both lower upfront costs but also improve the return on investment of the technology over time. Then we're going to go into how these robots can become more than just replacements for machinery or labor and truly realize their potential as sort of the central, quote unquote, brains of a farming operation. Finally, we're going to touch on how they're setting up distribution support and supply chains. Oh, and also a little bit on raising venture capital and how they're thinking about exits in this robotics space. In order to keep things fairly concise, I'm not going to go too far into the weeds about the technical aspects of each of the robots represented here, but I am going to do my best to at least introduce you to these six ag robotics leaders and their companies along the way as we go. So just as a preview, you're going to hear from, in order of appearance here, Andrew Bate, founder of Swarm Farm Robotics, Charlie Anderson, CEO of Burrow, or you might know them as Augean Robotics. Uh, Thomas Palomaris, co-founder and CTO of FarmWise, Bakur Vizzarelli, CEO of Z-Tractor, Paul Mikesell, CEO and co-founder of Carbon Robotics, and Trevor Thompson, president of TerraClear. So first, we're going to start with some comments on why now seems to be the time for an agrobotics revolution. In fact, as I'm recording this, we just heard John Deere announce the acquisition of Bear Flag Robotics. Uh, but just so you know, when this was recorded, when this roundtable happened, that was not yet announced, so it's not going to come up in the course of today's conversation. Andrew Bate of Swarm Farm Robotics is going to start our discussion about why he's excited for the industry. As a grain and cattle farmer in Queensland, Australia, he founded Swarm Farm to serve as a pathway to bring autonomy into agriculture. Their robots are versatile as they're built to deploy third-party attachments uh, used today mostly for weed control. They're also used on not only broad acre crops, but turf, orchards, and vineyards as well. It kind of feels like as a farmer, you know, there's all these ag tech companies coming to you with all these solutions. We can revolutionize this, we can do this, so we can show you this inside. But then you walk out of your farm office out to the field and look around and say, well, what am I going to do different to what I did last year? And, you know, the kind of the ag tech sort of stuff to now has been mapping and that sort of stuff, and big data type stuff. And this is where, I, like I said, I keep getting so excited about ag robotics because as a farmer, like coming from a farmer point of view, and not just, you know, from, from small farmers point of view, to fundamentally do something different in the field and how we grow our crops, that's the key to this. I think that... For so long, VC has been so looking for the next app, look at the next software, you know, analytics type of um, sassy type of thing. And um, I think that, you know, there's more interest than ever in, in hardware. And I think one of the big things in agriculture is we can't just revolutionise ag with big data and, and, and software. That actually, you've physically got to be in the paddock to really move the dial on sustainability and profitability in agriculture. And 
That's why I think agricultural robotics is going to be a really big thing because it's been underinvested in, you know, to date, I think. And, um, you know, while everyone's trying to get more data or imagery or, or do whatever to show something in the field, what we've been lacking is the ability to go in the field and actually do something fundamentally different to what we were doing last year, the year before, 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, you've got your traditional tractor implement manufacturer type stuff. But ag robotics is opening an entire new world of, of how we produce crops. And um, I think it's a really exciting time in agriculture. I think it's going to be exciting in BC as well as, as uh, investors are starting to realize this and uncover it about what this is going to do for agriculture. I love how Andrew described that about how robotics are a chance to fundamentally change how a farming operation happens rather than just kind of feeling like, yes, we have technology, but it's sort of the same old just now with data and pictures. But with this fundamental change can come some challenges, like, for example, the perception of a robot being just another tractor. This is something that Charlie Anderson, CEO of Burrow, talked about in our conversation. He grew up on a farm, then after his MBA was working at CNH, where part of his job was looking at autonomy companies for potential acquisitions. He then started Burrow, which is a people scale platform whose initial use case is moving hand harvested produce think grapes and blueberries and that sort of thing, with plans to expand into harvesting, yield mapping, and other autonomous tasks. But to the untrained eye, it looks kind of like a four-wheeler ATV with a flatbed on it, which can factor into this perception problem. There's a broader thematic in here that's tricky with an autonomous system to a farmer also. So like I, I grew up reading this, this newspaper, Lancaster Farming. It's like a, a penny pinching kind of saver thing where you can look at, you know, the used equipment down the road. And like you look at a used tractor that's 80 horsepower and it'll sell for like 20 grand, right? 15 grand. And I think that farmers in their heads as they're looking at these systems, they have a narrative of like, here's the piece of hardware that I used to buy. And you've got these smaller devices or different shaped devices. And you're not really buying a piece of hardware. You're buying a thing that does a task on its own. And that just creates kind of a different type of metric. And then as stuff gets smaller and becomes people scale, people are really, really expensive. And they're oftentimes are much more expensive than the equipment that is doing a lot of the mechanized work. So I think there's a, there's a shifting perception in terms of autonomous systems versus what's out there today. And that can be a little bit hard for people to kind of think through sometimes. That's a good point. Like a like a Roomba does not look like a vacuum cleaner. That's exactly, and, and and it's smaller, and it's priced a lot more than a regular vacuum cleaner, oftentimes. But it's doing a task in a different way, and I think farmers really have that narrative in their heads, rightly so, because you you can you can get a combine for five hundred grand, and you can get a carbon robotic system probably for something that might approach that, but is doing a task in a different way. You know, as an example, there are a whole host of other challenges for sure. But I think within this space, people have really locked into this notion of robotics as a service. And the reason they're saying that is because if you're an autonomy company and you're selling something as a service, you can get it into the marketplace before it's actually ready. And I think when I talk with farmers, at least in my experience, they want to buy a product and have some control over it and bring it into the field. And they want to try to buy it at a price point that's relatively similar to the other pieces of hardware they have. Like, you know, if you look at an ATV, an ATV in our case sells for like eight grand and we're selling a product that's roughly double that in the first year, but it's worth that much more because it is driving itself. It's not just a piece of hardware. I think that's a really important point for these robotics companies. Not only do they need to think about the ultimate return on investment to the customer, they also need to clearly demonstrate an immediate ROI. In Charlie's case, he's doing that with these small, affordable, autonomous, wally like carts that reduce labor costs on crops that spend 50% or more of their production costs on labor. The robots can stand on that merit alone, then bring the upside of where they might be developed in the future, like for harvest or for yield estimates, etc. But for larger and more expensive pieces of equipment, that can be more difficult to do which is why some robotics companies opt to start off with a robots-as-a-service model. In that case, they often are competing with the costs of maybe hand labor crews or custom farming services, and they can demonstrate the effectiveness of their technology on maybe a per-hour or per-acre or per-job basis. FarmWise has gone this route with their autonomous chemical-free weeding robot. 
They currently have dozens of machines working in vegetable crops every day in California and Arizona, with plans to expand from there. Thomas Palomares is co-founder and CTO. He also grew up on a farm, but in this case in France. I asked him if he could share a little bit more about their robots as a service business model. For us as a service, it's been more straightforward to uh, discuss with growers, in particular to come back to uh, Charlie's comments around like making the difference between a piece of hardware versus the task that is being done. That's exactly what we're trying to, we've been trying to achieve with the service where they don't see necessarily the hardware, but just like the task being provided on the field and they pay us for the actual weeding we've done on the field. So our price depends a lot on like the, the type of crops we work on and different uh, factors. Uh, but our goal is always for growers to save money compared to their current practices and see us really as like a, a scalable and cost-effective manners uh, alternative. So we're really charging so that they really save money from the first taker they start working with us. Uh, that's something that resonates a lot with growers and a lot of them are really excited about the service model, not to have to try to understand <laughs> deeply how like those robotic systems work. Uh, they can just call us, we go on their farm and we do the work. And a lot of growers, in particular the ones who've been working for several years, are now really excited about owning some of these machines and running them themselves. So yeah, our plan in the future is also to expand to either leasing or pure sales of our machines. So right now we're purely service-based and our plan is to expand in doing both. Thomas also mentioned not just expanding the business model, but also expanding the geography. He says he sees a lot of opportunities in places like Europe, especially where they're driven towards more non-chemical options, even faster than growers are in the U.S. right now. That, combined with rising labor costs everywhere, make the service an attractive option for their customers. Z-Tractors path to market with their fully autonomous all-electric tractors almost looks like a blend of Burroughs and Farmwise's model. They have started with small, compact tractors that serve vineyards, specialty crops, and smaller farmers, in some ways similar to Burrow. But they've also started with an as-a-service offering, and they've just now started selling units this year for 2022 delivery. They also plan to expand to broadacre crops eventually as they roll out their larger models. Here's CEO Bakur Vizarelli who also has a background in agriculture, as well as computer science, including graduate work at MIT. Right now, we also offer as a service, but it's only for limited geography in California, where we can do this with our relatively small team. But uh, I see the great synergy in the potentially partnering with some machinery rental companies, which can buy multiple Z tractors and they provide the service to the customers with autonomous electric tractors because it's more scalable than the model they have today with a driver and diesel and maintains all involved uh, dealerships. While if you own our tractor, it can uh, operate with uh, like one operator can take care of multiple tractors in multiple locations. So this is like a great advantage for the companies which are doing robot as a service or tractor as a service business model. But right now what we have available for the pre-orders from the farmers is uh, our smallest compact tractor, which is Bear Cup 24, the model. And it fits berry growers, grape growers, organic vegetable growers. And this is our target at the moment. To finish up this little section of the episode on business models, and since you already heard from Burrow, FarmWise, and Z-Tractor, I'll tell you that both Swarm Farm Robotics and Carbon Robotics are offering their robots for sale. And TerraClear has been offering them out as a service but gave farmers a chance to trial the technology and buy after a 30-day trial, and almost all of them did. More on that later. First, though, Charlie at Burrow makes a very astute point about agrobotics and goes deeper into this challenge of deploying this new technology on farms. This also sort of kicks off the section of our conversation about how these robotics companies can evolve from just looking like replacements for machinery or for labor and instead start being utilized as a central, quote unquote, brain for farm data. The number one challenge with autonomy within agriculture is that it's the land of tiny, tiny markets. And if you solve one problem comprehensively in one crop, you've got to 
kind of a, not a very good business. You know, blueberries, not, it's not a huge acreage crop. And so in our case, we build a people scale mobile platform that can go up and down rows, navigate autonomously, uh, uh, do a lot of navigation out in the open and also under canopies without GPS. And that product can be used in, again, table grapes, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, nursery crops, persimmons, stone fruit. Um, we've had people from the solar industry reach out and a whole host of other applications. So I think it's any situation where you have people running around that's not really heavily mechanized, there's a application for this type of equipment. And that means that we've only seen a, a small snippet of the possible uses for it at this juncture. I guess in our particular case, I think we're at a really, really unique point in time where you can suddenly build relatively low cost platforms that can navigate pretty much anywhere, recognize pretty much anything provided they've seen it enough times, and then increasingly can also manipulate the world with dexterity. And so in our case, we have a platform that is moving alongside people, packed with 12 to 18 cameras, processing about 1.5 terabytes of data per hour of runtime, and working in crops that are completely unmechanized with north of 15 to $17,000 in labor per acre per season. And so in our particular case, the way I anticipate things evolving is we're doing mobility today that gets you into moving fruit around, towing nursery trailers, carrying UV lights, doing a little bit of crop scouting. I mean, there's a whole host of jobs where you see people running around doing things. And over time, we are intending to modularly add dexterity, meaning doing some harvesting and picking and deleafing and some of those other tasks. And I think what you're going to see is a lot of platforms that might begin as a rock picker or begin as a weeding platform in one crop are going to become more and more all-encompassing within that crop. And then once they become more all-encompassing, they might jump from that crop to another. And at the same time, they're going to be a whole host of companies building other functionality around dominant platforms in each crop or use case, because no one company can recognize powdery mildew, do mobility, build a platform, do dexterity. I think it's likely you're going to have a number of companies and ecosystems kind of evolve in the same way that early PCs started as you know tools for kind of niche uses and over time became quite broad. I really like the computer analogy there. And you heard Charlie mention a rock picker or weeding platform as examples. Those are good examples because those describe the next two companies I'm going to introduce you to here. First, the weeding platform. So Paul Mikesell, who you're about to hear from, is the CEO and founder of Carbon Robotics. He actually co-founded the company with Shea Myers of Hawaii Produce, who you've heard on the show back in 178. I did a farm visit to Shea's place and also in our bonus episode here on Ag Labor just back in March. But anyway, Carbon Robotics provides autonomous weed control by using lasers, similar to a cutting machine, which can very precisely weed around crops. Paul has a background in computer science, deep learning, and computer vision, which he's developed with companies like Uber, where he worked on their computer vision and deep learning capabilities. He also sees the opportunity for these robots to collect, analyze, and leverage data. But this presents another problem, one we've talked about on the show before. There needs to be more accessible and more seamless data sharing capabilities. And, you know, part and parcel of us doing our daily jobs is that we get all this imagery and we already, we already are running these predictions through our deep learning platform, our AI platform. So we know where the crops are and how many of them there are and how healthy they look. We know where the weeds are and we know, uh, we know where the hotspots are and things like that. But this is um, bringing up an interesting point, which maybe we could talk about, which is that what I think would be bad for everybody is if all of these companies went out and had their own independent walled garden platform. And then as a farmer, you don't have any of the ability to jump from one to the other or aggregate the data together. Um, and I think there's a danger of that happening right now because everybody's kind of building their own systems. And so you'll wind up in a spot where, you know, you mentioned a good thing, Charlie, about this discovering powdery mildew versus what are the weeds. So as a farmer, you want to be able to see all that stuff together. And if everybody's doing this separate and there's not an open platform, we're going to wind up in a spot that just makes things worse. You know, like, why do you have so many apps on your phone, right? It's because, well, everything tries to keep itself separate. And so I think I would like to see somebody start uh, working together to propose sort of an open platform around this stuff. 
So that's one thing. And then the second issue that comes up around that is, as we keep moving down this road towards autonomy in the fields, we need to have some way for these different companies to work together so that they don't bump into each other and so that they can schedule around each other. And it's not even just the autonomous stuff, but it's things like where are the center pivots and what direction are they going and what are they spraying and things like that. We have this sort of field readiness for autonomy problem that I think we're going to have to work together to overcome so that we can have a cooperative environment. Airplanes do this with a system called ADSB where they talk to each other. So maybe it would be something like that, but we're going to need to have something like that. So I think those are kind of the, the two things, open platform for data sharing and collection and autonomy coordination that all of these companies could probably work together on in various ways. This is obviously not an easy task to tackle, but throughout the conversation, all of these founders definitely expressed interest in collaboration, which I think is encouraging. While Carbon Robotics chose weeding to get their autonomy out into the field, TerraClear went for many farmers' least favorite task, picking rocks. For various reasons, rocks surface in farm fields every year and need to be removed. TerraClear offers a service that flies a drone over the field to identify the rocks, then has a robotic arm that can mount on a skid steer or tractor to physically pick up each individual rock. This allows farmers to pick even buried rocks and to pick them quickly and can even enable operators to pick rocks in seeded fields. Company president Trevor Thompson agrees that this area that Paul was just talking about of data sharing is essential for the ag robotics industry to flourish. You know, machine learning is difficult because every field condition changes whatever you're seeing and potentially changes the effectiveness of those models. And so at a very basic level, we're saying, okay, what is the widest use case where people need to have, in our case, you know, a map of, of rocks, or but it could be weeds or it could be really anything else. And so let's get that one right first. And then let's sort of see, can we have a, a you know, transfer learning or other technical approaches that allow us to then add different field conditions that maybe have a, a little bit of a smaller market. So that's one comment, I guess, on the other end, just more generally, I mean, I think this is the challenge for solutions that are using AI in many cases is it is a tremendous amount of data and we've got narrow windows, you know, so if you're, if you're looking at a specific weed and you're looking at soybeans and you're looking at, you know, dark soil, that only really happens in, in a very kind of tight window. And so I think what we're kind of floating around here about data sharing or some sort of marketplace where we can kind of exchange data that's mutually useful we have to figure that out or else a lot of these solutions are going to take years because you're just really limited. So you've now met all six of our roundtable participants, Andrew at Swarm Farm, Charlie at Burrow, Thomas at FarmWise, Bakur at Z-Tractor, Paul at Carbon Robotics, and Trevor at TerraClear. Since you can't see them, I'm going to try to help you keep them all straight as we finish out our discussion with talking about supply chain and distribution and service, as well as getting investment into the space and the opportunity for exits. But before we leave this topic of open data sharing, I want to give Andrew at Swarm Farm Robotics a chance to weigh in. You see, they've developed what they call Swarm Connect, which is a developer ecosystem that allows independent developers to deliver their technology on their robots out in the field. So they serve as sort of a platform that other companies build on top of. With this experience in building this ecosystem, I thought he could offer some extra perspective on the collaboration needed here. Yeah, so I mean, I was just thinking, um, you know, we've had ISO bus in agriculture for a long time and tractors and traditional farm machinery, and it kind of felt like a promise that was that took forever to arrive. I mean, was, I felt like 20 years ago when ISO bus was first announced, it was all this interconnectability and operability was going to be what revolutionised ag, and it really only feels like the last three to five years that you know the broader agricultural user like farmers started to use it and you still hear a lot of frustration about compatibility that doesn't quite happen and I always laugh there's a, a an event every year called plug fest where you bring your suitcases of all your latest gear and they will plug it in together and see if it does actually talk and things like that but um you know, the fact that you have to do that makes it feel like it's just not quite right. And there is some stuff in ISOBUS for autonomy and, and stuff, I believe, as well. Um, not fully across it, but there's out there and talked about. I think the API approach seems to be faster to develop and kind of goes across, you know, broader industries and, and new technologies better where, you know, where you can create 
APIs with information that can be moved across from attachment to attachment or, you know, um, from service to service, whether it's an agronomy uh, type service, precision ag type service or something, you know, physical or mechanical. And I kind of feel like that's how it's going to evolve in the shorter time frame until we kind of work this out. But um, it is critical. I mean, you know, everything needs to talk, everyone needs to be able to work together. And um, you know, we believe in open systems and, and the ability of, of different manufacturers to be able to talk together and work together. So I think it's going to be key and it's going to take, you know, multiple players and literally hundreds, if not thousands of developers around the world to really, really make the most out of this agricultural robotics revolution. So challenges in data integration are certainly issues that continue to rear their ugly heads in ag tech, especially in this field of robotics. Another challenge that keeps coming up is connectivity. In fact, Paul at Carbon Robotics brought it up during our conversation about trying to develop service and support for customers. Yeah, our uh, at Carbon, I mean, we're the same. We you know we sell things, so we're we're dealership networks and partners in different regions to help service and support. And we're putting our own people in a lot of these places also. And we have found that service and support makes a huge difference. I mean, that's probably the number one thing that if I could advise anybody new starting, I'm sure these people are already doing it, but. Just really think about how to give great service and support to farmers because they need that. If something breaks, like you said, at five in the morning, they need it immediately. You know, one of our challenges has been one of the ways that we can help do that is by having great monitoring and alerting systems so that we can tell how the system's running at any given time. The problem is in a lot of these rural farming areas, we don't have great connectivity. The LTE is poor, spotty, non-existent. Um, in some cases, you know, farmers will try and augment with their own Wi-Fi systems, but those aren't great. I'd really like to see, you know, better uh, like Starlink support or some other ways that we can get better in-field monitoring. I don't know how the rest of you, you folks feel about that, but that's been kind of a, a hassle for us is just figuring out how to make sure that we have good connectivity so we can get reporting about what's happening, either just directly to the farmer or to us or to our support organization so that we can be there if anything happens and we can determine there's a problem before anybody, you know, really has to deal with it other than us. Now, I know I like to talk about the challenges that exist out there because I think it's interesting from an innovation standpoint, but I want to be clear. The ag robotics revolution is real. I mean, I believe it is happening and I have little doubt that it will be a big part of the future of agriculture, but it's not without these challenges. I mean, data integration and farm connectivity are two big issues we've talked about quite a bit on this show. But another one, and one that I'll admit I wasn't very aware of, are supply chain issues for getting these critical components for manufacturing and repairing these robots. Here's Andrew again from Swarm Farm, and then Paul from Carbon will also chime in. Yeah, it's a big effect. So um, we're in Australia manufacturing here, and so um, we have long lead time for shipping components. We've had to order all of our motors, computers, hydraulics, even wheels and tyres are really hard to get. A lot of the tyres we use are made in India, and obviously they've had a real big problem with COVID um, recently. And, um, yeah, it is really hard just with hardware right now getting getting those components. So in terms of manufacturing, we're putting a lot of resources and time right now into supply chain management more than we ever thought. We thought it was tough, you know, at the start of this year, but right now it's getting harder and harder and harder. So even with customers who've got orders locked in, we're being, you know, really upfront and making sure that we can deliver for those guys because it's just so hard to get parts at the moment. Amen to that. <laughs> Particularly like the microcontrollers right now, getting an MCU is like the lead times. I see Thomas nodding. He's probably feeling the same pain. It's, you know, stuff that was in stock, 50,000 components. Now it's, you know, 12 months lead time. You know, this is, this has been really challenging for certainly for us. And I think probably everybody here because of COVID, you know, I, I think you probably have seen the reports, but a lot of it was because the automobile manufacturers canceled all their orders. So then the supply chain stalled out Then COVID started ending and now people are starting to buy cars again. So they ramped up their orders again. And, you know, to run a fab, it can't, it can't react that quickly. You know, all of our semiconductors come from a different part of the world. And so that stuff has this huge leg now. So we're all kind of feeling that pain right now, I'm sure. We're probably all using GPUs of some form. We're probably all paying NVIDIA some, some money. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, you know, those are continuing to progress. We're fighting the gamers and the miners, you know, and folks with big data centers to fill up. Maybe for your viewers, we should just quickly explain why, why the GPUs are, are important. 
it's the brain behind all of the computer vision that probably all of us are using. Anything related to AI and deep learning is very dependent on these GPUs. What happened was back in the middle of the 90s, people started making special purpose cards for graphics, for video games. And what's happened since then is, you know, CAD took over and became an important application, et cetera. And then the last eight to 10 years, people noticed that what had been produced was these general purpose, what we call vector machines that work really well for simulating brains and particularly vision components of brains. And that's what we're all using for these deep learning processes. We use it for weed detection. We use it for furrow detection so that our robots can drive up and down the furrows. We use it for crop detection. We use it for everything on the machine. And so when people are talking about, you know, how do we get enough GPUs? In a lot of ways, it is the brains of all of our vision systems. And it's part of a much broader supply chain. It's also video games and it's also crypto and Bitcoin and everybody's fighting for these things. Now, overall, the cost of materials for robotics are definitely trending lower over the long term. But I still want to write this blog post about how gamers and crypto miners are holding up ag innovation just because I think it's good clickbait. But I won't. But I won't. We'll finish up today's episode with some comments on attracting investment into these hardware companies that have some unique challenges, which you just heard. And also how these company leaders are thinking about exits for their investors to earn a return on their invested capital. Thomas at FarmWise says, similar to the conversation earlier about customer perception of robotics, it also takes an evolved perspective on the part of investors to see opportunities in these types of companies. Similar as we were discussing earlier around educating customers around like, oh, what it means to purchase not a piece of hardware, but like a service or like a, an action. There's definitely similar things with VCs as AgTech is new or becoming bigger with like a education of VCs around like, oh yeah, we have these big hardware costs, we have this seasonality, but this is like the metrics we'll look at and this is what within those metrics, like that business is really exciting. And if you look at more regular metrics, like month to month growth, for instance, it might not make sense with seasonality uh, or things like that. And, and we definitely saw that we raised mostly from hardware and robotic VCs or VCs that invested in other hardware and robotic companies. So there has been other companies before us that went through that education for these VCs compared to some VCs we talked to that only invested in software companies and don't grasp as well those variabilities specific to ag tech. It's commonly said that ag tech requires more patient capital than some other industries, considering the seasonality and only getting one shot per year in a lot of cases. That definitely seems true for these capital-intensive robotics businesses. But Never say never. I mean, Bear Flag Robotics, as I mentioned at the top of the show, was founded in 2017 and just sold to John Deere for $250 million. But it's also important that we avoid survivorship bias here. Let's note that a lot of other companies don't make it anywhere close to that point. I mean, Apple picking robotics company Abundant being a recent example of one that closed its doors. I asked Trevor at TerraClear if these challenges we're discussing make it more difficult for hardware companies to not only raise money, but also to find successful exits, as Bear Flag did. He says it's important to remember that the value isn't just in the hardware itself, it's also in things like the data. To, to some degree, the, the conversation we're having you know, around hardware is the same issue, and that's that the reason you know there's such an opportunity is because it's hard and so there's been an over reliance on software to solve all these problems and when you talk to the customer or the farmer that's what you hear is hey, i've been promised a lot of stuff and it was all about you know uh not to ding well i'll just just leave it at kind of software only solutions and so we have this opportunity to be in the field and so i am calling out a very real problem around how do we use data or, you know, get high quality data at a scale that actually makes a meaningful impact on the farm? And I think uh, my, my answer, quick answer is the big, big companies have to make the same, they have to solve the same problem as, as we do, right? And so whether it's John Deere or TerraClear, you know, John Deere has a lot of data, but they still probably have a lot of challenges in how to get new high quality data. And so one of the things, you know, us in particular are focused on is, how can we collect data in an efficient way with products that are in the hands of farmers helping them today, but also be learning from those things and kind of growing our understanding. And so I think part of it is cooperation. Part of it is building systems that can actually acquire new data and use it effectively. And that's valuable. But when it comes to acquisitions specifically, 
there just aren't very many John Deere's out there. I mean, even Raven Industries, who recently acquired agrobotics companies Dot and SmartAg, was itself purchased by CNH, further consolidating the field. But that really doesn't seem to deter this group. As Paul at Carbon Robotics will tell you, any of them could be successful standalone companies, whether an acquirer comes along or not. I don't think there's any reason why any of these strategies executed properly couldn't be standalone billion dollar businesses. That's certainly our strategy. I think Trevor is nodding his head. I think probably everybody else is also. But so I don't think we have to rely on acquisitions as an exit. So I think you build useful stuff that people get a good ROI on, you sell it for money or you rent it for money, whatever you need to do, but and make a solid quality business, get to the point you're able to do hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue, make yourself growing up into a billion dollar company. We don't need to rely on acquisitions. I think there's enough here and this revolution's coming. Autonomy, robotics, deep learning, AI in agriculture is, is coming. So if the big companies don't see it, it doesn't matter. There's a long, solid history of innovative startups, innovative tech companies taking over and producing the next generation of stuff. That's what all of Silicon Valley is based on. You know, I think we're heading in that direction. So, you know, if the current crop of established companies don't see it, that's fine. You know, there was IBM before there was Microsoft. There was Microsoft before there was Google, et cetera. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today's highlights from the Agrobotics Roundtable. Thanks so much to these six guys for taking the time to share these insights. Please reach out to them, tag them on social media, visit their websites, and thank them for their contribution to this episode. Once again, that's Andrew Bate from Swarm Farm Robotics, Charlie Anderson from Burrow, Thomas Palomaris from FarmWise, Bakur Vizzarelli from Z Tractor, Paul Mikesell from Carbon Robotics, and Trevor Thompson from TerraClear. Thanks so much to all of you for being on the show. I am going to go ahead and post the full 90-minute video of this roundtable in the FOA community, assuming Patreon will let me do that. If you'd like to check that out and join that community, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash agriculture. Thanks as well to those of you who continue to share these episodes. As I'm experimenting with these different formats, it sure helps to get your feedback about what's working and what's not working from your perspective. Social media and email are great places to reach out with that. Thanks for your time and your attention. I never take it for granted. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation. Oh,